Hi, welcome to Upstream. I'm Zach. I'm Join Chet. Joined by a few guests. Yes, Chet is oh, here. Oh, sorry. I thought you were looking at me. To <laughs> you, you are Wait Chet. Wait your I, turn. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's oh. Sherry. Wow, such extremes. We're already seeing the extremes. Uh, Miss Sherry, good to have you back. Great to be here. Uh, we have a special guest today. It's Lexi. Me. It's me. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Glad you're here, Lexi. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, hey, we got an awesome topic. I'm not exactly sure where it's going to go, but I'm also a little excited about that. Um, We're talking about violence today. We are. And talking about violence in our world. and. Um, the response of believers. And we're going to get some biblical insight. We're going to get some practical insight. I'm excited about, not excited about the topic, but excited to direct believers on how to behave in the midst of this culture. Amen. Amen. Well, good. Let's pray and we'll jump into it. Lord, thank you for your word. And God, as we discuss and navigate uh, the depths of the world we live in, but also the depths of your truth and what that means for us today. God, would you guide us and direct us? Would you open our eyes to see things unseen and help us to be uh, the people, the lights that you've called us to be? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I mean, we've had some major events in the world that have happened recently. Uh, July 13th, we had the assassination attempt on uh, former President Trump. We've had an increase in school shootings. Uh, I just think <clears throat> violence has been on the rise. Um, and it's something that maybe we've just started getting used to. Yeah, it's, it seems to me as you watch the nightly news, it goes from one violent thing to the next, whether it's rhetoric or it's actual physical assault. Um, Sherry, what would, you, what would you say, how do we define violence? Yeah, anything that hurts. Um, Good, simple definition. Um, our problem with violence is the, the desensitizing that's happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was reading some stats. In the 1990s, there were about 10,000 acts of violence that we viewed on television or media. Today, there's about 20 to 25 every hour. Mm. And we're consuming seven plus hours of media a day. So you and I just personally mm -hmm. are seeing an, an enormous amount of, of violence, whether it's on television and the entertainment we're choosing, uh, the media we're choosing, or even just the news. Well, if you look at the percentage of video games that involve violence, yep. it begins <coughs> at a young, a young age where parents are buying video games for their kids to destroy human life, to it, video games are all about destruction. So I think the desensitization, there it is, um, I think it begins at a very, very early age. At that foundational growing age, it's violent has become part of the culture. Do you, sorry, do you think that, how different is that than it used to be? Because you used to play Cowboys and Indians, you used to, like, you had things that were violent to a degree. Here's I, the difference. When yeah. we played Cowboys and Indians or watched it on TV, Rawhide was on the other day on the Me TV show. Rawhide. Yeah. Or, or Wagon Train or any of this. So when you shot <laughs> someone, he grabbed his chest or abdomen and went, Ugh, yeah. and rolled over. You shoot someone today and you see the gory details of, of the wound, the, the blood, the this, the that, the other thing. So the difference is when, you, when there was a violent act in, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the violent act was was a sound and maybe a, mm -hmm. a very bland version of it visually. Not so today. And to your point, a kid 14 years of age is seeing over 8,000 murders on, on TV, not to speak of his gaming time. Yeah, Sherry, and I, not to excuse um, your generation, because uh, I love Rawhide and so I much. love Bonanza. Don't make fun of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would never do that to you, Sherry, um, but never would I do mm. that. Uh, but I want to kind of go back to an understanding, violent sells. And so yes. whether it's a rawhide at, and it was accepted at that level, but there's something else about violence that no one realizes the repercussion of the fact that violence sells. Violence does not stay stagnant. It grows worse and worse. Mm. During the war in Liberia, um, one of the things that I experienced personally was that if a rebel child soldier cut someone's hand off, the next soldier would cut the arm off, the next soldier would cut both arms off. Yeah. Violence has a tendency to grow. So I don't, going back to Rawhide, I understand that there was the bullet, but it sells. People would watch because of the bullet. Now it's just gotten gorier because that's the nature of violence. It just grows and it grows and it grows. And 
even to our, our, our news, what is the definition of news? A news uh, uh, executive who's choosing to put what stories on at six o'clock, what's he choosing? My, my, my little line is, it's who shot who on which corner. There's, the, until he gets to that last little, little Pollyanna story at the end about the kittens or the whatever, uh, all of the stories leading up to that have some element of violence. They're either reporting it on, a, on an international or national mm -hmm. basis, or it's in our own community, it's arson, it's fires, it's some form of violence. Even our news defines life in the context of violence. And I'll go to the Trump attempted assassination. Um, and this is not a pro-Republican or pro-Democratic, pro-Democrat statement. Um, you've got President uh, Biden who says basically put a bullseye on Trump. The very next day, someone actually does. So there's a 20-year-old who has grown up with all of this stimulus who took that seriously. Now, I know that there are, I'm not blaming him and I'm not putting it on him, but our rhetoric has gotten violence. And the way that we communicate is there's no, there, the, the threshold keeps raising in regards to the bars that we keep crossing. Mm -hmm. um, Lexi, look, at us, as a 20 year old, 20 something, um, and how old are you, Lexi? I'm 23. Ooh, 23 years old, right? A um, little child, as far as, you're, <laughs> as, far, as, far as you're concerned. I was waiting for that. <laughs> but Lexi, I mean, you grow, do you feel that your culture is um, sensitive or desensitized to violence? Oh, definitely desensitized. I mean, you're, you have kids who are exposed to pornography at as early as like age seven, even earlier than that. And what do you define pornography as? I mean, some of the billboards that mm -hmm. we current driving mm -hmm. down the 405 great are yeah. borderline pornographic. Right. I mean, you drive, I don't know how they raise children in Las Vegas. I really don't. Like, you've got to drive through Las Vegas with your, you know, with blinders on both sides. I always, every time I minister in Las Vegas, I ask the parents, how do you raise your children here? It, because there's a desensitization. Yeah, yeah, and even um, I was talking earlier about how growing up, like the biggest shooting for me was Sandy Hook Elementary. That's mm. when my school started shutting down and doing active shooter drills. So you have my generation who's grown up doing active shooter drills to where we don't want to go out in a public concert type space because of that, um, that fear. But even, um, like I said, mentioning earlier pornography, you have kids who are shown early in age and right. then they get addicted to, it's like a drug, you get addicted to more violent, more That's violent, actually, more violent. And that actually is very, very true. Mm -hmm. There's a stimulus, there's hormones mm -hmm. that are released that kids get addicted to yeah. and seeing. Sherry, 40 year, was it 40 years ago you started Stony Brook in mm -hmm. Orange County? Um, were you ever thinking about active shooter drills 40 years ago? No, and in fact, I was reading something the other day that talked about around that time frame if you ask a kid, what are you worried about? What are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. It would be it would be thing like the boogeyman in the closet, mm -hmm. you know? And you ask that same kid today, second grader maybe, what are you mm -hmm. afraid of? He's gonna have a litany. Yeah. He's gonna start with the violence in his community. He's gonna talk about kidnappings. He's gonna talk about, you know, what if, uh, uh, if the war in Ukraine uh, comes over here? He's gonna talk about dropping bombs. He, he, he's got a whole different set of fears. And, and cartoons are not helping us mm -hmm. either. You might think, well, there's a safe place for kids. Not so. Again, statistically, they're showing 20 to 25 violent acts an hour on every cartoon. Well, and I'm sorry, but I'm gonna to go to my generation of Bugs Money of Roadrunner. Uh, how many times? But well, what happened to Roadrunner after you thumped him? Yeah, how many <laughs> he times? He jumped right back how up. How many times did Roadrunner or the Coyote fall off a cliff, get flattened, or something where then they would just unflatten and keep going. It almost gives kids the feeling of I'm invincible, and um, some of the, and I call it a doctrine of Cartoon Network. Um, the doctrine of Cartoon Network is violence is okay. The doctrine of, of Cartoon Network is parents are dumb, kids are smart. And if you are careful as a parent to actually watch the cartoons that your kids are watching, you'll see the doctrine. I mean, when I was growing up, Bugs Bunny, cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, you, this little character, and his name was Cirrhosis of the Liver. I had no idea of cirrhosis uh, at that time, but they're preaching a doctrine. So obviously it's something that has been happening throughout history, but I mean, even as Lexi said, the reality of how it's been developed, I mean, like 
kids used to play outside more than they do now. So just the reality of what's, it's not just what's being produced and what kids are seeing on TV, it's the reality of them seeing it more. So what does that, like what do we do well, with that? I think we have to understand something biblically first. This is not a surprise to God. So Jesus made a very emphatic statement. He said in uh, uh, Matthew, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, let's, what were the days of Noah? The days of Noah were filled with violence. You in Matthew 24, is that what you're so, Yes, Matthew 24, thank okay. you. Um, uh, filled with sexual immorality, filled with violence to the point where God regretted making man. Mm -hmm. That's how violent mm -hmm. it was. Um, and we have to understand when God's regret of man, it's the, the understanding is, is that he was so saddened by the state to which sin had brought man to, mm. filled with violence and filled with sexual immorality. Is that not our current context Yeah, today? I was going to say, so are you saying we're there? Um, what I'm saying is the Bible is not afraid to tell us where society was going to get to. Mm. And in particular, uh, and you have to, sorry, sorry, you have to think of how prophetic this was. He was speaking to a culture in Jerusalem where everything was God. Everything was monitored by uh, like Jewish culture and context and everybody was purposing to be godly in some sense even though he denounced the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. He's speaking as a, they'll never be like the days of Noah again, we'll never get there. Jesus was being extremely prophetic, didn't, I think, looking into the 21st, 22nd century. I was just going to say, if you pick apart Matthew 24 a little bit, maybe three things pop up as characteristics. The eating and drinking. Did you look at look up the word eating? I did for the first time the other day. It means to crunch. It's not a, a social, mm. let's have dinner together. Mm. This is to shove it in like like the hyenas. I, I was on Masai Mara one time on a, on, a, on a safari and listened to those guys crunch bones. Mm. That's the idea. We don't even socially know how to sit and have a meal together. There's a there's a reveling in it. It's a it's a non appropriate, non social kind of event. Go to every any restaurant any day of the week and watch a family yeah, sit they, down. Exactly. If there's four in the family, there are four on the phone. Exactly. They're they're on the phone instead of having conversation with the person. So, in front but of prophetically, them. he talks about there's eating and drinking, gnawing and a crunching going on, marrying and giving in marriage. There's where the the loose social. And, and sexual practices all come into play. And then Lamech's uh, idea, the, the sin of Lamech, where he killed, and he bragged about it. Mm -hmm. There's our violence. And all in a prophetic God. mindset. He mocked God yes. about it. Mm -hmm. So in Lamech's culture, he says, if God could avenge seven times, I'm gonna avenge 70 times. Right. So I'm greater, basically what he's saying is, what culture are we in? I'm greater than God. Mm -hmm. The culture that we're living in is, there is no God or go to, what's his name, Nish, how do you say his name? God is dead. So we're in that culture where we've tried to denounce God, get rid of God, and look at the fruit of that violence. And verse 39 of, of Matthew 24 says, they knew nothing about what would happen. They didn't have God in, in, their, in their viewpoint. Mm. Good word. Well, violence is growing. The need is obvious. So if you look at the church, and, and we're, we're gonna have to cut this section, we're gonna go into uh, another uh, episode, but I'd love for you guys in the next one to develop this. What is the church's role? How do we address this? Because obviously in the days of Noah, the way that God addressed it was very severe. What does that look like for us? So I uh, wanna invite you guys back, join us for the next session.